Hello, you're back. Welcome back to Scripture in Black and White. We're thankful that you tuned in again with us. Uh, I'm Anthony Walker here with Bobby Harrington. Uh, we've been dealing with um, marriage uh, and divorce and some of the uh, teaching uh, in the scriptures from that and some of it has been a little difficult. Uh, Bobby, if you will, kind of walk us through some of the things that we talked about in the last Great. session. Great to be back with you, Anthony, and thank you everyone for staying with us with season two as we focused on marriage and the family. And this will be our last podcast for this season. So we're ending on a very distinct note talking about marriage and divorce. So in our last session, and if you haven't heard it, I want to encourage you to go back and listen to it. We covered six points. And as we begin, I'll just mention these points. Number one, uh, God established marriage and it is good. We just think it's so important to, to talk about the goodness of marriage today. Number two, God made marriage for companionship, sexual enjoyment, and godly offspring. Number three, the Bible's teaching on marriage and divorce should not be imposed on non-Christians. And we're saying this for Christians to help us think clearly about how we interact with people who don't know Jesus and they don't know his teachings. Of course, if you do know Jesus, if somebody claims to know Jesus, a lot of times today we're having to say, this is what Jesus teaches and uh, how important it is to hold to that. In fact, we're going to spend a little bit of time today with Matthew 19. And I just commend that to everybody watching and listening to us to become really knowledgeable of what Jesus teaches in Matthew 19 about marriage and divorce. Number four, regardless of people's past, we should welcome them into our churches. Because so many people don't know what Jesus taught, or um, they, were, they were in churches that didn't uphold it, which is happening a lot. Uh, when they come to our churches today, by and large, uh, we start off and say, hey, from this point forward, let's agree we're going to follow the teachings of Jesus, we're going to obey them. Uh, you can't unscramble scrambled eggs. So uh, when, when, when we all come, with our scrambled eggs, from this point forward, let's obey Jesus. Number five, God's teaching on marriage and divorce reflects God's relationship with us. In fact, if I could start one place, it would be that, that God loves us, He sacrificed for us, uh, He sent His Son to rescue us, and uh, God would never leave us, and He'll never forsake us on His part. Uh, and He wants us to have that same attitude Jesus said, as I have loved you, so you're to love one another, especially, obviously, that would apply in a marriage relationship. And then the last point last week started off kind of controversially. Jesus teaches that divorce and remarriage results in an adulterous relationship. So it's not just, hey, I'm going to divorce my, my spouse. It's like I'm going to divorce them. And if I get married to somebody else, Scripture says that's an adulterous relationship. That's pretty serious stuff. I better work it out so that I don't, I don't go back to that. Sure, sure. Anthony, if you would, point number seven uh, is this. Jesus gives us an exception. Divorce, divorce is authorized in the Bible for sexual immorality and desertion by an, an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk, we'll talk a little bit more about the second part in terms of uh, a teaching outside of Matthew 19, but... If you could, go ahead and take us through Matthew 19 so we can look at what Jesus teaches. So in Matthew 19, uh, beginning at verse number one, uh, when Jesus finished saying these things, he left Galilee and went to the region of Judea to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Uh, sometimes the Pharisees, um, in their efforts to undermine what Jesus was doing, they tried to ask him these gotcha questions in the crowd of many uh, so that regardless of the way that he answers, they've got him. Oh, well, if he says this, then oh, he's established a new precedent. Well, if he says this, oh, well, he contradicted what the prophets and, and we've all known. So, so they were trying to catch him. You can just understand that was the reason 
that the question was asked, but there's also some, a teachable moment in this. And Jesus responds, verse number four, haven't you read, he said, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female. And for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. What does Jesus do here? He takes them back to the reason and the design for marriage. God made them male and female. God joins them together to become one flesh. You leave your father and mother, you are joined to your spouse. And that's God's best and God's intention and design for marriage. In that context, guess what we don't really have to talk about? We don't have to talk about divorce because we know how it was designed, but they weren't finished. Verse number seven, why then, they asked, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Well, since that's the reason, Jesus, well, then why did Moses do this? Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard, but it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Jesus reiterates the teaching that uh, Bobby laid down in, in our sixth point, but Jesus gives the exception to the rule here. He says, except for sexual immorality. Verse number 10, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, <laughs> it's better not to marry. And I want to illustrate here, um, even for them, this, this teaching that Jesus gives, which is not different from what they had already been given, but really living it out, the weight of this covenant relationship. It's very serious. And to hear that they said, well, man, if, if we can't put her away for any reason, if we can, it's better just not to marry. Yeah. Jesus, ah, listen, guys, listen, the heart of God has marriage uh, there in its core. Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. Uh, so in, in this teaching, Jesus again lays down God's design and intent. Uh, and I'll share this and, and I want you to kind of come in as well, Bobby. One thing that I do with couples that may be going through a rocky point or even just kind of not necessarily rocky, but just kind of shaky point. Sometimes I have them to pull out their wedding album. Just go back and look at the day. Uh, and I, and I, I do that for this reason. Jesus takes them back to the beginning yeah. of where it was. And I try to take them back to remember where you guys were here. Remember this. This is what we are fighting for. This is what we're trying to, you know, I know right now it may be a rocky and difficult season, but but when we go back to the reason and we go back to the covenant and we go back to that day, that gives us some grounds to fight for the marriage and not necessarily fight to end it. Oh, that's good. So um, when the Pharisees asked Jesus the question in Matthew 19, uh, they were uh, thinking about a debate by two prominent rabbis in their time, Shammai and Hillel. And the debate was about Deuteronomy 24. So let me read it to you. And then we can see how Jesus resolved the debate. Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 says, If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her, and sends her from the house. So he's going to say uh, that the, the man who divorces his wife uh, when it comes to a relationship with her afterwards, he, he can't just do what he might want to do. But the question then became, when he says, if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him, or if he finds something indecent about her. So Moses is saying, if that happens, he can write her 
a certificate of divorce. Uh, in Jewish law, it's called a git. He could write her a git. Um, now, what is the indecent thing? So that's where Hillel and Shammai were debating. Well, Jesus answers it clearly. He says the displeasing thing is uh, that person that you're married to gets involved in an adulterous relationship. They're breaking the bonds of the marriage at a very deep level by sexually being involved with somebody else outside the marriage. And Jesus is teaching that that is the only grounds. It's not God's desire. Mm -hmm. God's desire is reconciliation. I would even say that in the case of adultery, uh, it is grounds for divorce, according to Jesus. But if you could work it out, that would still be the best. It's going to be the best for the kids and all of that. The difficulty with adulterous relationships, Anthony, is that uh, once that happens in a marriage, it's very hard to, um, let, let me state it uh, in the reality that I've, I've observed. Once an adulterous relationship begins, it is very hard for the person in that adulterous relationship to give it up and come back and be committed to their spouse. Um, typically what happens uh, in adulterous relationships is that there becomes, a, it's called lemurance. Mm -hmm. It's a, actually a, 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 a biological chemical reaction. You know, that feeling of being in love uh, really can bond you with somebody. And typically in adulterous relationships, uh, this lemurance thing is going on and it becomes very difficult for that person to give up that uh, relationship and come back. Now, now again, if they can, I, I, I still think it's the best. Sure, sure. But Jesus is saying, in light of Deuteronomy 24, that if your spouse becomes involved in an adulterous relationship, that that becomes grounds by which uh, God authorizes a divorce. Mm. So that means that when you divorce that person who is in an adulterous relationship, you become free, you're not bound, and so that you are somebody who can marry somebody else and that second relationship will not be adulterous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Now, why don't I go ahead and uh, jump into what's called the, the uh, uh, Pauline exception or the Pauline addition to that. Okay, so if all we had uh, was the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we would have Jesus teaching uh, that the only grounds of divorce uh, is an adult, you know, our partners in an adulterous relationship. Paul, I think, is saying the same thing in 1 Corinthians 7, but there's nuance. And so let's look at the Pauline exception. Um, I'm going to start in verse uh, 10 of 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, to the married I give this command, not I but the Lord. He's clarifying, this is me, this is the Lord. A wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. We're going to talk about separation in just a few minutes, uh, but uh, he's giving the basic principle that when you're married, you're to stay committed to each other. Now, there may be reason for separation, and we're going to talk about abuse, which in many cases is a reason for separation. But notice he says uh, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. So the basic principle is consistent uh, with Matthew 19. Then he says this, uh, skipping down to verse 13. If a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. So if you're married to a non-Christian and uh, you're, you're not supposed to divorce them, like they're willing to stay with you and you know, you're bound to them. Even though you came to Christ, you were married to a non-believer, you still stay married to that non-believer. Uh, he says this in verse 14. Uh, For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife. 
There's some discussion about that. Probably the relationship has been made holy uh, you know, through his wife. In other words, the marriage bond is holy. And the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. So far, so good. Now the Pauline exception in verse 15. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So that expression, if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. So what this is envisioning in the text is a, a Christian married to a non-Christian. They should stay married. But if the unbeliever leaves, what are you going to do about that? If the unbeliever abandons the relationship, abandons the marriage, what's the believer to do? And Paul says, you're not bound in situation in, in such circumstances uh, because there's nothing you can do. Now, I think it's similar to what Jesus said because when the non-believer leaves and deserts the marriage, the odds are really high they're going to hook up with somebody else. So it's a version of the same thing that, that the person you're married to is eventually going to enter into most likely an adulterous relationship uh, because they're leaving you. Um, but even if they're not, what are you going to do? When the non-believer leaves, they leave. And uh, you're not bound, Jesus. Or Jesus says through Paul, you're not bound in these circumstances. Mm. You want to jump in on that? No, no, no. You, you, you handled that uh, very well. And, and the only thing I would say, again, with, with all of this is, you know, it, it gets kind of hairy, you know, kind of difficult in ending the marriage this way. But as Jesus began, the heart of God is towards that, those, that man, that woman being together for life. Yeah. Like that's the heart of God on yeah. that. And we have to work towards that. You know, in, in ministry, we're, we're pushing towards, we're aiming towards, we're encouraging towards, hey, work it out, work it out. And there are so many success stories you've uh, illustrated and I've heard as well of things that you would have thought they would have never worked out. And I've just seen it so often. It just makes me believe in saving marriages. Absolutely. Because we know it can be. Yeah. And, and I, you know, this is an encouragement that, that the resurrection, you know, everything that we deal with relates back to the gospel of Christ. The resurrection is the encouragement for anything that seems dead. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anything that's been dead because he got up from the grave, it too can be resurrected. So as, as difficult as it is, uh, it can still be uh, saved. Hey, Anthony, before we uh, go to the next point, or if you wanted to add something, I, I wanted to talk about uh, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 15. Okay. Uh, it's clearly describing, it says, if the unbeliever leaves... Mm -hmm. Okay, so a couple things. A, they're an, a non-believer, and B, they leave the marriage relationship. Okay, some people will try to use this verse to justify divorce today. Uh, here's how it often will be. Well, I'm, I'm married to so-and-so, and they're like a non-believer. Yeah, no, that's not the same. So I can divorce them. Right, no, that's not the same. Even if you're married to a non-believer, you don't get to divorce them. Yeah, yeah. If they leave you... What can you do about it? That's what he's talking about. Right. He's not talking about you using this to justify getting rid of them. They're like a non-believer. Yeah, like, yeah, because, <laughs> you know, at some point in everybody's marriage, the person you're married to is going to be like a non-believer that day with what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, you know, but that's where we learn to forgive and work it out. So again, it's the non-believer married to the Christian and not the Christian but the non-believer leaves and abandons the marriage relationship and, and scripture teaches you're not bound. Uh, number eight, um, this was one that was brought up in our discussion in uh, Matthew chapter 19. Sexual immorality is a sexual relationship outside the biological husband-wife marriage bond. Yeah. So you want me to talk about that? Uh, it's funny how we have to define it now 
but we're living in a time like what is sexual immorality? So uh, when Jesus gives the description, he uses the Greek word porneia. We talked about this in an earlier episode. In Judaism in the first century, porneia was equivalent to all the sexual sins described in Leviticus 18. Okay, so that included uh, uh, sex with somebody you're not married to. Uh, it included sex outside marriage, which was adultery. It included homosexual sex. It included incest. In fact, Jesus does something uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew uh, where he defines uh, sexual immorality. He said, if you look at a woman for the purpose of lust, you've already committed porneia in your heart. So Jesus is setting uh, a really um, low bar for what uh, sexual immorality is. When he says that, he's not talking about, you know, somebody notices somebody's attractive uh, or that, you know, somebody stumbles and falls and kind of... Uh, well, he is saying when you're lusting which is a look with a purpose. You're purposefully looking at that person to covet them and think about, wow, man, and, and to, in your mind, right. enjoy the thought they're mine, and I, I have them sexually. That's, Jesus defines that as adultery. Now, I want to come back to pornography because that actually matches pornography. And pornography is so common and such a problem in many marriages that we have to talk about it. But in the first instance, of course, in the first century and, and in the Mosaic Covenant, they didn't have access to pornography like we did. But sexual immorality, again, was any sexual relationship except a husband and a wife in the bonds of a covenant marriage. Okay? And... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, gives us the way to think about this, the marching orders. It says this, flee sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. So uh, flee sexual immorality. Uh, it's really important. We need high boundaries. So when you work with women, uh, if you're a man working with women, I think you need to have high boundaries about lunches with them and getting engaged with them. Uh, if, if you're a woman working with men, same thing. High boundaries, uh, raise high boundaries to protect your marriage because it is so easy mm -hmm. to become emotionally and physically attracted to somebody that you're not married to. And uh, all of us, we just have to admit we live in a time in our culture where men and women interact a lot with one another in ways that previous cultures that didn't happen. Like men and women in a company may travel together on trips out of town. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you get in situations where you're in the same car, staying in the same hotel. Mm -hmm. And we just have to be people that have really high boundaries. Some people have made fun of it, but I actually like the Billy Graham rule. The Billy Graham rule was that he would not be alone with a woman of the opposite sex without his wife or somebody else there with him. And uh, the reason that I like that is because, you know, I'm a red-blooded man. And I can, I can get into situations where my flesh would take over. But if I set up boundaries, I'm protecting myself, I'm protecting my wife, protecting our marriage, I'm protecting our family. And I think it's so, so important uh, that we do that. And I'll tell you something. My wife has always been really good about that. Jealousy hasn't been a problem in our marriage. But one of the reasons is, is because she has really high boundaries with, uh, with other men. That she's not going to get into a situation. Because I don't care how godly you are. You are subject to temptation. And you can fall in love and become infatuated with somebody that you're not married to very easily. So have high boundaries. Uh, I commend the Billy Graham rule and uh, just give it over to you to say if you want to uh, say anything about that. Oh, you, you, you've underlined it. Um, and and that, that whole 
concept of sexual immorality, any of that kind of thing. I know we're in a new age now where, you know, prior to this, we probably just would be able to talk about men and women and women and men, but we're in an age now where you're dealing with women and women and men and men, and, and even that still applies. Uh, any kind of sexual uh, relationship outside of the bounds of marriage. Je Jesus said it this way. He said, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Mm. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Mm -hmm. And he, it's hyperbole, it's an exaggerated speech. He didn't l literally mean pluck out your eyes, but he said, take extreme measures so that you won't stumble into sin. And I think when uh, we're in such a sex-saturated culture, um, you know, again, sex is good, but uh, God has strict commandments and rules about how to channel that to the marriage relationship. And I think that we should do that. Amen. All right, so I want to tackle something that's a difficulty. And I want to be careful not to overstate uh, something that I think has nuance, but I want to talk about pornography. So Jesus in Matthew 5, 28, I quoted it earlier, but I'll read it again. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So what Jesus says is if you look at somebody, like it's a look with a purpose. And so we live in a time where uh, it's so easy to stumble and look at pornography, look at naked women and uh, not just naked women uh, for, for men, but women also are attracted to pornography. Sometimes it's the love story with pornography that they're attracted to and they end up indulging in what Jesus uh, is talking about. Uh, let me just talk about what, I'm going to be real explicit here of what's happening and what we're dealing with. In my church we've had this, uh, I'm sure in your church and other churches, uh, around around the, the country, that pornography becomes a life-altering addiction. We stumble and fall. The vast majority of men stumble and fall. There's a certain percentage of men who stumble and fall, and it becomes an addiction. Uh, let me uh, describe the profile of addictions that, uh, that rise to a, a level that I think they're equivalent to adultery. So here they are, the husbands, the husbands were engaged in viewing pornography and masturbating over it for hours every day. Husbands would not accept help from professionals, that the husbands uh, would not respond to accountability in the church, and their behavior springing from the addiction, and we gotta realize this obsessive preoccupation with pornography got so dysfunctional that oftentimes they either weren't having normal sexual relationships with their wife or they were wanting distorted sexual things that they'd seen in pornography and it was long-standing behavior the question we had to face is is that adultery like jesus talked about and is it grounds for adult uh, grounds for divorce? Now, at some level, um, if you take what Jesus said in Matthew five, uh, where he said that adultery is looking at somebody for the purpose, you know, of it, mm -hmm. the truth is we would all get divorced because at some level, every you know, every woman at some level coveted another man, or a man looked at somebody that he shouldn't have and and fell into lustful thoughts. Sure. Sure. Uh, I don't think that that uh, rises to grounds for divorce. But we concluded, Anthony, with the profile I just read to you, where it's a ongoing life-altering addiction that the man or the woman wouldn't give up, that when uh, confronted with that by people who felt like they needed to divorce their spouse, we concluded that was equivalent to adultery. And uh, we, we um, helped the women come to peace uh, because they wanted to, to divorce on that grounds. 
uh, because they felt like they couldn't save their marriage. So uh, that's uh, how we dealt with it. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. Oh, again, an amen on that one. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult in the way that the society is going, um, especially for our younger generation. Uh, everything is, has become so isolated now uh, and individualized that it's easy to fall into that trap of kind of isolation. Uh, and this is not just in marriage, but even for young and single people, um, you know, you've got, you know, DoorDash, you've got internet to your home, you've got everything that could keep you isolated in this, and now even your own lust and, and all of that, it just keeps you in and outside of what God wants you to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have to, as Paul would say, flee also youthful lust. So can, I, can we pause here as well uh, with a word for those who are caught up in uh, sexual addiction because it can get uh, for that person, they just feel like this bondage and they can't get out of it and it controls their life. And so we, I just want to speak a word of compassion. First of all, again, I just want to say this, any marriage uh, where you can work through this and reconcile, that's going to be the best if you can do that. Uh, at some point, uh, people determine that it can't be and they've got to go and experience a divorce and move on. So I just want to commend that to everybody watching and listening that you can overcome uh, pornography addiction. And I know many men who have done so. I commend to you Celebrate Recovery. I commend to you uh, SA. I commend getting a recovery sponsor. And I also encourage and recommend uh, counselors and programs like Steve Atterburn with uh, New Life Ministries, I believe it's called. I had a book several years ago called Every Man's Battle. And uh, there are resources like that that, that that can help you. Good, good. Uh, number nine, abuse often necessitates separation. Yeah, this is a big one. Um, it's a big one because abuse can be a common thing and uh, abuse is a bad thing let me read to you from first Thessalonians chapter 4 it is God's will talking about Christians here it is God's will that you be sanctified or holy that no one should wrong or take advantage of a brother or sister so um, there are people who wrong and take advantage and become abusive most often it's men who are doing this with women, but sometimes I've known situations where women were abusive uh, of the men. He says this, the Lord will punish all those who commit, commit such sins as we told you and warned you before. So it, it's a serious thing to uh, abuse and mistreat. Now it can be physical, it can be emotional. It can be verbal. Uh, and these things are not right. And the Bible envisions that Christians are a part of a church. And if you're a part of a church with somebody who claims to be a Christian, then this is where you call in the elders of the church. And uh, a woman in a situation, and I've had women in this situation, would come to uh, the elders or the, the minister, pastor, uh, and, and share, and you need to share because an abusive person doesn't want you. They want you keeping it secret because then they can isolate you and manipulate you, but you can't let that happen. You've got to go to your church and get help. And uh, 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 you've got to get help and you've got, other you've got to get other people to know this. And it's not good to let an abuser continue to abuse you. It's actually more loving to confront and bring in other people to stop the abuser. So the Bible teaches that uh, in situations like this, as we mentioned earlier, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, there is a context of separation. Mm -hmm. In the context of abuse, 
it is uh, it the the call is separation but it's not grounds for divorce and that separation in some cases may need to be a long time and that separation might be vitally important especially pr to protect children in an uh, abusive situation uh, violence uh, keeping children in a situation where there's abusive violence is is uh, really bad for children it's really bad for the spouse and uh, I'm just an advocate of separation uh, in those situations and I think scripture as we've said here scripture also uh, applies to this so I'm gonna turn it over to you brother Walker to add anything you want to add there I don't know how often you've dealt with it but I've dealt with it a fair bit over the years. I've dealt with it uh, a, a ton, a couple of incidents here and there with, with couples that I'm aware of. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's, it's very difficult because, you know, when you, you go back to the beginning, sometimes there were seeds there that you may have overlooked, you know, during the engagement, during early, part of your dating life, you know, and you just thought, you know, maybe he'll be better once we get married and all of these kinds of things. And again, why I'm such a proponent of a lot of research and digging and prayer on the front end, even in situations where, oh, there's such, you know, this kind of person, but they're abusive. We got to get this taken care of. It may be something that we can work through here, but once you're married, oh man, that becomes even that, that yeah. becomes difficult yeah it doesn't you know for for some people watching or listening to us they're going to be thinking about their children mm -hmm. uh, who are married to somebody and and there could be abuse or uh, mistreatment and it's really easy for parents of their adult children even though they're Christians to justify uh, divorce but again separation uh, is sometimes necessary uh, and and sometimes that separation is, is can be long term but the ultimate goal and desire is reconciliation mm -hmm. if that be possible and in fact I've seen it work out and reconciliation uh, be something that comes out about it mm -hmm. which leads us to number 10 all right our last point Oh, okay. Churches should seek to excel at supporting and affirming celibacy for singles. Um, wow. I, you know, I think sometimes we lean in really, really hard to married couples and lots of married prep and marriage enrichment ministries and marriage counseling and marriage therapy and marriage this do you think sometimes we may overlook the singles Bobby yeah I know we do do you know that for the first time actually I think this came about uh, statistically in the United States uh, and, and I'm sure it's true in Canada as well that uh, over the last couple of years for the first time in American history the majority of people are not married really yeah. So a lot of that's because, you know, older men tend to die before their wives. But the majority of people in the United States today, the majority of adults are actually not married. Wow. Yeah. So when we look at our churches today, uh, here's the reality. We're going to see a lot of single people who've been through a divorce uh, for whatever reason. Uh, many of them came to Christ afterwards, but we're going to see a lot of single people through divorce. Uh, we're going to find a lot of young people in their 20s and early 30s are not marrying today and then we're going to have uh, people who are transgender or homosexual in orientation which we also talked about in earlier episodes and uh, they're they're seeking to follow Jesus and they're going to be living you know single celibate lives mm -hmm. and I think like the early church our churches need to be extended families where people single people feel like that the church is their family even if they're not married to somebody they do have a family and it's it's the local church body where they have brothers and sisters mothers and fathers and children in fact i actually love being able to talk about this with you because of your story that you shared earlier how uh 
your mother was a single woman mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for a period of time and uh, how other men in the church invested in you and then even your stepfather you still had a spiritual father sure. and uh, I, I just want to challenge and encourage everybody that the idea that church is just uh, something you come to on Sunday morning, like a service that you come to, um, it's not the biblical picture of the church and it's not sufficient for the high number of people who are going to have sexual struggles living as single people called to celibacy. And we just want to uh, make the church a family where we support people who are living a celibate uh, single life, where we have relationships with them. They have relationships that are part of our families. As we talked about before, uh, uh, when I lived in Canada, a friend of mine, a homosexual man, we just made him part of our family uh, because he needed those kind of close relationships to help him be faithful. Well, now it, there's a whole bunch of people who need the closeness and support of the church as family so that they can live single celibate lives faithful to God. Uh, the Apostle Paul was single and celibate. And Jesus was single and celibate. And Jesus was... You know, a lot of people today think it's not possible. They think, you know, like you're missing life if you are not sexually involved with somebody. We have a lady in our church uh, just a couple of weeks ago who was saying, you know, People often talk to me like I'm missing out. And she said, my primary commitment is to be a godly woman. I'm living for Jesus. I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. Uh, being married would be great. But I don't have that right now. But I'm not missing life. I still have a good life, a happy life, following Jesus in relationship with people. And uh, because of, of who Jesus is, I can live this life now. And because of the help of my church, I can live a single celibate life. And I have not uh, missed life just because I'm not sexually involved. Sexual engagement is not the most important thing in life. Sure, yeah. The Paul, relationship Paul with God and relationship with others is. Paul, Paul mentioned his single celibate life was actually an aid to his ministry. It gave him some more time to dedicate to the work of the Lord. So yeah, you're not missing. There's tons of opportunity uh, to continue in service to the Lord. Uh, any more you wanted to add on that one, Bobby? Um, I, I, I want to move to just concluding okay. with talking about uh, here's some resources for help. Okay. I want everybody to know that as we've gone through this teaching, you might be thinking, wow, uh, this is something I haven't heard much of before. The idea that um, marriage is permanent and that only the only grounds for divorce would be adultery or possibly desertion is actually the traditional Protestant position. So if you go back to the 1500s, really up through the 1970s, it is the mainstream, it was the normative, it's the normative way to read scripture and that's why it was the, the, the normal Protestant position. Uh, I want to acknowledge that a lot of people are explaining it all away. And uh, the reason that we're not trying to explain it all away is uh, Jesus is our Lord and King. And uh, we believe that God loves us and gave us this teaching, that Jesus gave us this teaching for our good, for the good of our children, for the good of our churches, and for the good of our community. So um, I just want to commend everybody. Examine the scriptures see if what we're saying is true, and if it is true, seek to obey God. So let's conclude. I have some, let me just, I'm going to share these recommendations, and then if you can comment on them, add anything that you want, and bring us to a close. The first thing I want to recommend to anybody who's uh, having difficulties like what we've been talking about is share your struggles with leaders in the local church. Find an elder, find somebody uh, who's trusted who's an older godly person, and share with them, especially the elders in your church, especially if you're struggling with uh, anything that they can help you with. Secondly, if you're in a crisis, I want to recommend uh, 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 intervention. Now, Marriage Helper is a ministry that our friend Joe Beam uh, initiated. You can go to marriagehelper.com. 
And uh, they have these intervention seminars where people in our church, we've sent them to them, and they've literally saved marriages. Now, there's also good crisis counseling that can help. I would encourage you to work with your church to find a godly biblical counselor because most counselors are not going to follow the teachings of Jesus. So you've got to find a godly biblical counselor who actually is going to help you to follow the teachings of Jesus. Thirdly, I've already recommended this, but I want to recommend Celebrate Recovery, or if there isn't a Celebrate Recovery, uh, a, a good 12-step program. And 12-step programs are all over the country. Um, I did a lot of work with 12-step programs uh, in my master's uh, degree that I did in counseling. And uh, 12 steps came out of Scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, it was Christians who came up with the 12 steps. It's best when the 12 steps are tied in with Scripture, okay. but sometimes today that doesn't happen. Uh, but you need to get recovery, especially if, if uh, there's uh, alcohol abuse, pornography addiction, uh, these kinds of things. Please go and get recovery help. And then uh, number four, uh, this is more for church leaders, but it can be for everybody. We just need to have access to biblical counselors. Counselors who are professionally trained, but who uphold the teaching of Jesus first and foremost. So thanks, everybody. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Yeah, if there was any other ones that I would add, just as an encouragement to uh, churches, one thing that you can do that we do at our church um, to link up with the older couples there um, and, and Ooh, have good. them to help these younger, uh, younger couples, um, you know, just small group settings and things of like that kind of thing to have some group dynamic. Staying around those healthy, positive marriages can be an encouragement and enriching to uh, those couples going through some uh, difficult times. It is our prayer and hope that through this season, uh, discussing uh, marriage, the family, parenting. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed it, but we hope that you've also been uh, encouraged, edified, enriched in your life by what God's Word speaks to uh, marriage, parenting, and, and family discipleship. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed some of the uh, guests that we've had and interviewed, and we pray that uh, that information has been beneficial to you and all the resources that we've given. Always remember that any kind of resources that you need on the things that we've talked about are found on renew.org slash media. You'll find our landing page there. We'll have articles and all of our other uh, podcasts as well. So we thank you for tuning in with us this season on Scripture in Black and White. Be sure to share it with someone else that you uh, have uh, you know, partnered up with or you may be discipling uh, as well so that it can help their marriage, their family, and uh, their parenting journey as well. So thank you this season. Um, we look forward to seeing you on the next season as well. God bless from Scripture in Black and White. Bobby Harrington from Scripture in Black and White here. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining us. Hey, can you help us? If you could like, comment, and subscribe to our channel, that would be great. Just subscribe to Renew.org, and then you'll get notices when the next episode from our podcast or other Renew podcasts come out. And it would greatly help us, and we hope and believe it will greatly encourage you. 